<clears throat> yeah, good evening, class, and uh, welcome to today's um, a live session on business analysis. We are continue, um, continuing from uh, where we stop on um, business analysis techniques. Actually, need to start this uh, business analysis techniques afresh. So, business analysis techniques are the techniques we use. Um, to do our work as business analysts. These are sort, um, sort of techniques that helps us to, to do a thorough analysis uh, from uh, the initiate stage to the um, closure stage. So throughout the, the project life cycle. And uh, we have um, so many techniques that we uh, use as business analysts to do a proper analytic work. Uh, starting from managing the projects, as um, uh, looking at the, the, the stakeholders, um, the project uh, team, uh, requirement elicitation, requirement analysis, gap analysis, requirement evaluation, requirement design, uh, screw management, uh, screw event management to clo uh, project closure. So these are the ones we are going to treat. This is not the, the only uh, techniques we have in business and there are so many of them, but I hand pick the, the most relevant uh, one in the market that will, will help us kickstart our career in business analysis. But if you want to go into research, or there are so many of them. And if you start getting more advanced and experience in business analysis, there are more other ones you, you might want to know. You know, more especially if you are start if you start um, building your career in Six Sigma, uh, trying to get to black belt, you, you will find out that there is so many more advanced and complex business uh, analysis techniques. But these are the basic ones. Even during interview, these are the ones you they want you to, to, to show your commercial experience or awareness or knowledge of. Under stakeholder management, we use RACI metrics and we use uh, stakeholder analysis. We use personal analysis. Under rate, uh, risk management, we use red block. Under requirement elicitation, that is requirement gathering, we use interview, we use observation, we use so, uh, workshop, we use um, survey uh, stroke questionnaire. Under requirement analysis, we use process analysis, process modeling, data modeling, root cause analysis, gap analysis, prioritization, stroke muscle analysis, and business case. Then, under requirement, um, uh, under solution evaluation, we use. Um, uh, solution evaluation still comes under requirement analysis. So let us not be confused. So the solution evaluation, we use brainstorming, vendor assessment and SWOT analysis. And these are the, uh, the techniques we use during the initiation of a project, that during initiate stage. Then when we come on that defined stage, the time we start designing the, the solution um, for our project, we are looking at um, requirement design techniques, which uh, here we have uh, 
user story, acceptance criteria, use cases, wireframe, stroke mock-up, and test cases. So during requirement, uh, during the um, execution stage, when we start developing our solution or our software, we use a Scrum event management. We use Scrum, or here I use Scrum because we are going to use um, Agile methodology. So if, if we are planning to use waterfall, we can use waterfall to, to do that. But on that Scrum, on that Agile methodology, we are going to use a Scrum events because this is the, the, the most popular framework uh, within the market now. So that's why we are going to use a, a Agile Scrum. And here we have a sprint planning, daily stand-up, sprint demo, and the sprint retrospective. And after that, we have closure stage. You know, during closure stage, uh, the business analysts, we have to do it, um, sign um, a report, just a client uh, acceptance report. That's mainly what business analyst, analyst is going to do. But it's the duty of the project manager, and you can work with business analysts, but it's ex exclusively the duty of the, the project manager to write the project closure report. But in most cases, as a business analyst, they see you as a project manager. So if you know how to do um, project closure reports, that's very good. So let's look at uh, stakeholder management uh, tools or techniques. We have a communication plan, we have um, racing metrics, we have a power grid, and we have a stakeholder analysis document. So we are going to start with um, racing, racing metrics. Racing metrics is an effective way to define the rules and responsibilities of various stakeholders towards achieving a common goal. It, be, it brings clarity to the roles people uh, play within the project. Racist stands for responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed. So before you, you start your project, it's very good to define everybody's role so that everybody will understand what they are going to be doing within the project. So, and to do that, we use RACI. At the left hand, left hand side, we, we list the activities or the tasks or deliverables that we are going to be delivered or we are going to work on. So RACI matrix is equally an um, an ongoing document is not a one-off document. You continue to use RACI um, to manage your, your, your project as a project manager and as a business analyst. And as a project manager, it's very good because once you do your, your uh, project breakdown structure, you find out the, the deliverables or the activities and you list them using racing metrics. So you know what everybody is doing at every point in time. This will help you to track the project. So as the project um, uh, progresses, you keep on adding more activities in, in the race and you keep on the, um, defining, knowing who is doing who and who is doing that. So it, it helps you to continue to manage your project without struggling uh, at this point, it will help you to address the issue of uh, some people uh, being uh, uh, too much uh, engaging in too much overlapping or being overzealous 
or people not really doing their job very well, or issue of uh, pointing fingers when something goes wrong. With your racing metrics, you look at the racing metrics, you know whom to um, hold responsible uh, using racing metrics. As, as you can look, as you can see from this um, uh, sample of these metrics, here you can see under activities, we have a customer complaint reduction. That is the activity. They want to, to reduce the compl uh, customer's complaint. And under this particular activity, Adam is the sponsor of this particular activity. So Adam is accountable. Adam makes sure that uh, this job or this uh, deliverable uh, is being carried out within the accepted, accepted standard. And Peter here, uh, being a subject matter expert in this particular activity, need to be consulted to be uh, very much informed of how to do this. And um, Sarah need to be informed because Sarah might be the person that will be using the solution at the end. He might be the end user of this particular deliverable. So he need to, she needs to be informed on what is going on because she's very interested in this particular um, activity or deliverable. Zakaria is equally a subject matter expert. So he, Zakaria needs to be consulted. Zakaria equally is a black belter. And um, Harvey here is responsible for carrying out this activity and deliverable. So if at the end of the, uh, this period, and this particular deliverable is not being uh, is not delivered at due date. Then um, Harvey is going to be held responsible because under RACI we can see that Harvey is responsible for this, and you can see other activities. That's the way is uh, is being analyzed. So that is how to use RACI uh, metrics. You can see from uh, what we are seeing here, the importance of RACI metrics. It clears a lot of confusion, a lot of uh, uh, ambiguity within the, the rules. So everybody knows what they are doing. It's highly defined. You cannot say you don't know what you are doing because if you have a copy of the RACI, you should know what you are doing. You should know what your responsibilities are. Then the next thing we are going to look at is um, stakeholder analysis. This racing matrix is, is equally used to, to analyze stakeholder, but is mainly for project team. But you can equally you can use it to analyze stakeholders, but it's, it's, it's better to use it to analyze your project team and then use stakeholder analysis to analyze your, your stakeholders. A stakeholder analysis document, uh, we have, um, we're going to look at them very soon, but let's look at um, how to conduct a stakeholder analysis. To conduct a stakeholder analysis, the first thing is to invite the stakeholders, invite the team and key uh, represent representatives from the management. Explain the purpose for conducting the stakeholder analysis. Brainstorm the individuals and group who may be or who may have a stake in the project or change efforts. Plot each individual or group 
on the power interest metrics, sort them by the power they have and by their interest in the project uh, change. Identify the gap. Identify the gaps between the current and the desired involvement level. Create a communication plan to manage ongoing communication with the uh, stakeholders. So that is how you manage your stakeholders. You do your stakeholder analysis with the uh, document provided here. We are going to look at them one after the other. So let's uh, look at the stakeholders first to understand who is a stakeholder within the organization and who is a stakeholder within the project. Because someone might be an organizational stakeholder, but not really a stakeholder within the project. So but when you understand the organizational stakeholders, it's going to help you to understand their project stakeholders very well. So a stakeholder is um we've had, uh, identified we've uh, defined stakeholders already so let's look at who is stakeholders here the employee is a stakeholder a senior executive is a stakeholder shareholders they are stakeholders customers are stakeholders suppliers to contractors they are stakeholders End users, they are stakeholders. Family of employees are stakeholders. So your wife or your husband or children, they are stakeholders. Because um, when something affects a member of the family, like if, you are, if your child becomes sick and you are taking your child to the hospital, it might affect your involvement within the project. You can take uh, some days off in order to look after your some families, and that means that there is affecting, affecting you, affecting the project as well. So that's why families of employees are stakeholders in an organization. Investors are stakeholders. Lenders are stakeholders. Partners are stakeholders. Unions to regulators, they are stakeholders. Community group, they are stakeholders. The media, they are stakeholders. Government, they are stakeholders. So all these people are stakeholders. So you know, government being like, uh, when we talk about government, government, um, government, um, regulations, policies can affect the organizations. And when we talk of uh, regulators like CBN and the rest of them, one of their rules or the uh, health and safety officers or the ICOs in terms of uh, GDPR, this, their, their regulation can affect the organization and the project. So that's why all these people here are, are stakeholders. So once you understand these people who are stakeholders in the organization, then you start looking at how many of them here are going to affect your project, because not all of them might really be interested or be have um, a stake in their, in, their pro, in their project. So let's look at the project stakeholders. A project stakeholder is any individual or group who is responsible for any of the project activities or will be affected by the project or its outcome. And the stakeholders here are the project leader, which is the project manager, the project team members, process owners, people who work on the processes, customers of the uh, process output, suppliers of the process, operations manager, finance manager, procurement manager, HR to training manager, 
performance manager, senior executive, managers whose resource, resources, shadow, budget, or result will be affected by the project, by the project. These are the stakeholders of your project. So if you are managing a project, this is how you first uh, try to identify the stakeholders. Like when I was saying the first thing you need to do is to identify the, the, the stakeholder. With this, you can see you've uh, identified the stakeholders. And from then, you move them to group them into uh, categories or subcategories. So now you've identified your stakeholder. The first thing is to identify and all these stakeholders and uh, um, group them into logical categories. You can see here you've grouped under the project here. This is the group, the project managers, project leaders. Then within the organization, you can see the um, senior management, uh, process owners. This is how you group them together everybody will be on their category help you to understand and sort your your project out and their project will be very clean why is when you start grouping them like this you will find out we are not going to struggle because everything is tidy and very very clear to you Then the second thing after grouping them is to analyze them based on their uh, roles and characteristics, which is power, interest, away, and uh, supportive. Looking at this table, you can see here the stakeholder will have, um, here, this, here is the stakeholders, that's where you list the stakeholders by their names, then you lose them by here by their position in the organization. Then project uh, role, you list them here by their roles within the project. Then here you list them by the power they possess. Yeah, either they are very poor, high powered, or uh, like very influential, uh, high power, low power you leave them here. Then here is based on their level of um, awareness on any of the um, deliverable within the project, their level of awareness. Then here is their level of interest in every activity within the project, you try to ascertain the level of their interest mainly when you are trying to engage the stakeholder if the stakeholder is not uh, being responsive you should if a stakeholder should be responding within two days and he's not doing that you find out that he's responding within one week then he, he, his level of interest is under uh, doubt and for that matter, if a stakeholder is behaving that way, it means that the stakeholder is not being supportive. So this is where you indicate all this. These are indicators that will help you to manage your stakeholders. Know when you are, when some of these indicators are flashing red, then you know that you are beginning to step into trouble. And then you are readjust and try as much as you can to correct and get them back into green colors. So that's how you manage uh, uh, them based on their rules and their characteristics. So all these documents, we are going to look at their practical, um, uh, some of them they, they, in, in a more practical way. So the next thing, is to classify stakeholders into four groups according to the power um, they hold and whether they are interested in the project or not. There are four groups of um, 
uh, stakeholders here. We have um, key players, we have a context setter, we have a crowd, and we have uh, defenders. Under this um, high interest, uh, high powered stakeholders, we have two groups, which is uh, context setters and key players. These are the high powered stakeholders. And these are the people you should um, uh, focus so much attention to make them happy. Under the context setter, you can see they are in red. Um, they are in red uh, color or in red uh, garment. These people, most of the time, they don't have uh, interest in your project. And they are very powerful people. They have the power to stop your project. They have the power to mess your day up. So you need to understand what they need from you and give it to them. And the only thing they, most of the times they need, what they need for you is uh, abide by the regulatory framework while doing your projects. These people can be regulators like CBN. They can be regulators like um health and safety officers they can be regulators like efcc you know these are the people they can be regulators like icus like if you are if you are managing more especially this is very very powerful policy or regulation in in a western world Europe and the UK GDPR. When you when you consume customers or clients' data, there is level to which you can consume. You must specify why you are consuming data and the amount of data you must consume. So if you go contrary to that, you are in trouble, and you can make a mess your project up or it can mess your organization up with a heavy fine. So these are the people like most of the time, you know, as a business analyst, uh, analyst, you are going to be dealing with a lot of data, You're going to be doing a lot of data analysis. So you must know how to um, go about with uh, managing uh, clients' data using um, GDPR. So when you come to key players, key players are the project sponsors, program directors within the organization. So they are the people that they, they, they initiated this project. So they are highly interested in the success of this project. So they are very powerful and they have high interest. So what do you do? Engage them closely, very often, to make sure that the requirements you are using for these projects is what they want. Make sure that you validate every activity um, you, you, you perform within the projects, carry them along as much as you can. Try to be transparent with them. Try to make them happy. They want you, so they, they want you to succeed. They can do anything possible to make you succeed. You see some people, they start saying that they have a difficult stakeholder like, like the, 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 program, the projects, Sponsor is uh, difficult. How can somebody initiate a project and become difficult? They don't want you to succeed. Maybe you are not doing the right thing. So you, when you understand these people very well, 
at the end of your projects, uh, we move very smoothly. So you try as much as you can to engage them. Then we have other stakeholders here. These people are the low powered stakeholders. They don't have high power. Like the crowd here, they don't have a high power and they don't even have interest in this project. So you monitor these people very well. The interest here, these people can be the, the technicians that are coming employed in the, uh, employed within these projects and their interest is their daily pay their time sheet how much can they make from this project if this project with my experience most of these uh, technicians they are praying and they are doing everything possible to delay the project which is contrary to the project um, success. If the project is meant to be six months, you find out these people within the crowd here, which, they, which these are technicians, they are praying for this project that's supposed to be for six months to last for two years so that they can have a job. That is so. How do you uh, handle these people? You monitor them monitor them, make sure that they do their job, you prompt them to do their job. That's how you manage people like this. Then here we have uh, defenders. Defenders here, they have high interest in this uh, project, but they don't have power. And why do they have high interest? Some of them here are the, they are going to be the users, the end users of this particular solution. So you find that maybe you are improving the way they do their job with a solution. And there are some of them, they might be very happy to see the outcome of this. So you keep them informed. Some people are this, um, this box might be vendors, solution vendors like Microsoft, like uh, Salesforce that are planning to sell their software. These are the people like using um, software, selling software as a service. So, if it's uh, maybe they are saying well, you, are, you are trying to implement a CRM solution or enterprise resource planning solution or e commerce solution. So, once they find out that this is, they will be pestering around you so that you can, um, you can buy the solution from them. So, these are the where this kind of people belong. So, you consider them, keep them informed, but you don't waste much time on them. <clears throat> then, the third step here, you have an idea about the level of involvement of each stakeholder, then you need to look at the gap where the stakeholders are at the moment and where you want them to be. So this is the gap you need to cover. The, the, the gap between the current state and the desired state within this project. So for instance, if you find out that um, a stakeholder is not interested, you can see here, this is unaware, this is aware, this is interest, this is supportive. 
But say the stakeholder is not interested through his activities, you can see that he's not in, uh, interested and he's not being supportive. That can be very frustrating within a project. So what do you do? You work hard to get their interest and to get their support. That is what you use this uh, involve, involvement uh, planning worksheet to do. Then after that, the next thing you need to do is um, to create a communication action plan or action worksheet. And how do you do that? Here you see the stakeholder. All the stakeholders need to put their contact information. You decide the method of communication within the, the organization. If the organization doesn't have any standard way of uh, communicating, most organization, most organization, they use um, phone and they, they use email. Like we can see here within this, our, our program, we are using um, WhatsApp for, for fast communication, but most organizations, they don't use WhatsApp because WhatsApp can easily be hacked. Somebody can just share a link and somebody will just come into the group. And maybe before you know it, hijack the group. So that's why WhatsApp, WhatsApp um, is not, um, is not uh, used. Mainly companies will depend on their, their, their risk analysis. That's why I would decide which method. So you specify the method, is it by phone or by email? Then you specify whom, who you are contacting. Then how often do you contact the stakeholder? Some stakeholders, they don't want you to be disturbing them all the time. So because of that, they have a specific um, uh, do a period of communication. If it's weekly communication or weekly report, they, they expect you to write, bring your weekly report at the end of the week. Not you, if you have any little, you call the stakeholder, you communicate, or you keep firing email. To, they don't like it because they have other things they are doing. So you understand how often you need to communicate them. If you mean to be communicating every week and you're sending them email, it can be irritating. So you, you try to avoid that. Follow your action plan, communication action plan. And when you communicate to a stakeholder and the stakeholder uh, gives you feedback, you log it here, you log, you log the feedback. The feedback here will help you to understand how um, supportive is it, is it a negative uh, uh, feedback, positive feedback, this is where you get uh, you log your feedback. So this is um, the document we are going to be using. That is how it's going to be looking like in terms of a stakeholder um, analysis. So this is the template. We are going to have, we're going to send it uh, to you guys very soon, so you can start using it. So you can see here rules and involvement worksheets. These are uh, the where you you write the stakeholders, their position, their rules, their power, their level of awareness. Um, their level of interest and the level of uh, support you are, you are getting from them. So this is the involvement uh, worksheet, which we've discussed. So this is the current and the desire. So, and this is the communication 
action worksheet or communication plan. So here, this is the stakeholder. This is communication method, whom, how often, phone, email, and uh, feedback log. So that is uh, how you do your stakeholders. So now, look. let's have uh, a look at this, um, uh, this case study. In this diagram, or in this year, <clears throat> you can see here is the stakeholders. We've identified the stakeholders by their name, and we've identified stakeholders by their position, and we've identified stakeholders by their role within the project. Here you can see Adam. His position in the organization is not actually his position within the project. So his position in the organization is finance manager. And position within the project is a finance advisor. And his power is a very powerful person in the organization and within the project as well. And the uh, level of awareness, somehow aware. And the uh, level of interest is not really showing interest in this project. And whether he's supportive or not, he's a very resistant person. So he's not considered to be supportive. So then let's look at another person who is. Um, neutral here you see operators here is line operators users of improved process their interest is they are low low interest somehow aware and interested yes and the supportive neutral is not supporting and he's not um he's not he's just there so then let's look at sarah here sarah is a training uh manager and under the project is a training facilitator uh, sarah's power is a medium Although in the interest grade, what we have there is, uh, is high or low. So under if someone who have a medium power we can classify the person to be high power under uh, interest, uh, under power metrics. So the level of awareness, yes. Uh, interested in the project, yes. Supportive, yes. So this is how you you plot your stakeholders when trying to, to capture them within this uh, um, diagram. Then now you've uh, captured the stakeholders, identified them, then you need to plot them within the power grid. This power grid is going to be a indicator, it's going to be an indicator for you. Looking at it, you'll be seeing, um, looking at the red lights. When you have so much red lights, then you know there is danger for you. But let's start from here. Let's analyze based on power and interest. So all the people that uh, have um, high power and low interest should come under this uh, red uh, column. And those that with high power and the high interest should come under engage. And those with low power and low interest, these are the technicians, like I said, they should come under this monitor group where you monitor them. These are the people you prompt to do their job because they will want the project to last forever, which is not good 
for the project manager. And the people here are mainly the end users of this uh, solution. So these are the people you need to, to, to consider. They can be vendor, um, pro, um, solution vendors as well. So this is how you plot them within the power metrics. Then you come down again within the power metrics, then uh, try to understand them based on their level of awareness. So here, the people with bigger um, with a bigger ash color are the people that they are aware. So the people with a medium ash color are somehow aware. And the people with smaller ash color are unaware. So you can see their level of awareness that Zachariah, which here that's supposed to be the sponsor, is uh, very much aware of um, everything that's going on within this project. And uh, other people like Adam is somehow aware, actually he's, a, he's an external stakeholder, so he's somehow aware. And the technician here, they are not, are really showing so much awareness. They are not aware of, they don't show the, their level of awareness is, uh, is poor within the project or some deliverables. So supervisors here, um, Sarah is uh, very much aware. So his level of awareness is high, though it doesn't have a, uh, uh, so much power, but she, her level of awareness is high because he might be the end user of this particular uh, project, uh, this particular solution. So that's why you look at their level of awareness and plot it. Then the most important of all is this particular one. This is where the, you need to concentrate mainly when you are doing your stakeholder analysis or when you are managing, actually not even doing the analysis, when you are managing them. These are the indicators we are talking about. All these red and green lights are indicators of problems. When you all your all your indicators are red, then you have serious problem. You need to do a serious risk analysis. Here is red is resistant that is uh, non-supportive. Neutral is neutral, not supportive and not um, resistant, which is not good. The desired level is supportive. So when you are managing a project, even if um, during interview, these are some of the questions they are going to ask you. How do you manage difficult stakeholders? So, and to manage the difficult stakeholders, first, you forget this interest uh, um, power metrics and plot them you know whether a stakeholder is difficult or not from all your analysis uh, indicator from the communication their feedback you should have known how a if a stakeholder is difficult if a stakeholder is difficult then all you need to do is do everything you need to do possible to get them from this difficult 
uh, from this resistance level to supportive level. Anything you can do by engaging them, by being transparent, by communicating with them, often trying to carry them along to make them happy for them to win their support. That's how we are going to what we need to do. But we need to do this proper analysis to understand who is um, uh, supportive and who is not supportive. So this is where this particular power grid comes handy because it's very, very glaring who is supporting you and who is not supporting you. From this, our, our power metrics here, we can see those are supporting us. And we can see where we have work here. The major work lies on how to get Adam's support and how to get Sammy's support. This procurement manager, yeah, you need to get, but these are the major uh, big men here. They have high power and they are not supporting. They can really cripple our projects. So we need to get their support as quickly as we can. So that is um, all for stakeholder analysis. Um, using documents like a power grid and the rest of them. So at this point, if you have any question, then I can take it before I proceed to the next uh, topic. Okay, no questions. Um, the next thing we are going to look into is the pestle analysis. Pestle analysis is a strategic and structural tool for evaluating the external factor that affect the way an organization uh, performs and grow. And to look at these external factors, we look at them from these six uh, point of view from these fa six factors, which is a political factor, economic factor, social factor, technological factor, legal factor, and environmental factors. And under political factor, government policies, these are government policies that can cause instability and uncertainties within the business and the project. Examples are labor law, corruption law, and various regulations, various laws. Then we we'll look at economic factors. Economic factors affects the profitability of a business. Example of such are wealth distribution, spending habits, and interest rates. Using spending habits as an example, when the spending habit is very low, the economic activity is going to be very sluggish when people don't spend money. everything within the market is going to be dull and it's going to affect the profitability of the companies or the the organization wealth distribution if you are if you are working on a project that is going to be within a particular environment look at the wealth distribution if it's a mainly poor people that live within that area. 
then you should look at if these people can afford this kind of uh, product or solution. So these are things to take into consideration. If you are planning to implement a food delivery system and uh, you are in um, Lagos and you are doing that within um, within a jugunle, it's going to be difficult because nobody wants to spend money um, for these patch riders. They will go out and buy their food by themselves or go to the restaurants or the mama put and eat the food. But if you are somewhere within Lekki and VI, you see that so many of them will not want to do, go out because of uh, they want to have their lunch. Instead, they just jump into the app and order their food and get it delivered to them because they can afford it. So these are, are the things you are looking at. So if you have, for instance, if our project is a food delivery app, so these are the things you look at. Or if it's like an e-commerce where people like to order online, this is where you look at this kind of uh, uh, income distribution or le level of spending habits, uh, uh, something of this uh, nature. So let's look at um, social, social and cultural uh, value, the social factor. These are the, the, the social and cultural value within the organization, uh, where the organization is operating. And this, uh, we're looking at the level of education, the language within the environment and the, the lifestyle. So if the solution you are trying to uh, develop or deploy within this environment is for, is a, highly complex solution that takes time to understand like application you should look at the level of education within that environment is a uh, uh, another one is you look at the, the lifestyle of the people within that environment before you deploy a solution so just like I use uh, um, e-commerce application, people within the rich group lifestyle, they tend to do more uh, online service than other people. So let's look at uh, technological factors. These are the uh, factors uh, in modern business, which is uh, the examples are new technology. Uh, yes, if, if this kind of technology, if you are trying to 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 bring a new technology uh, within some environment. If you look at their level of um, skill sets, not everybody can actually um, use a Zoom for, for educational purposes. So if you are trying to bring this kind of solution or this kind of uh, business, you look at the people within the environment. Another one is legal factors. 
if you are bringing a solution, you must make sure that the law governing within that environment or the country, for instance, you are now in UK, you are trying to bring a particular business to Nigeria. If you look at the law, legal framework, legal requirement within the regulatory environment. Some businesses in Nigeria, you cannot do it here in UK. So these are the things you look at. I know so many businesses in, in, in UK here that are very difficult to operate in Nigeria because of regulations. Other ones are environmental factors. When you are bringing your solution, you look at or your products, you look at environmental factors within that um, the, the target area of uh, business. Here we are in, 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 in temperate region where most of the time the, we are in cold, in cold uh, weather. Looking at the weather here, 70% of the time here is uh, cold here in UK or in Europe. So if you are going into a fabric industry or a fabric trying to start up a fabric company as a project, in UK or in Europe, then you should know that um, you should be targeting mainly warm wares. If you are going trying to start similar business in Nigeria, looking at environmental factors, if you are producing warm wares, nobody is going to buy you your product. So you're looking at um, uh, clothing that, that, that is, um, I mean, um, good for, for, for tropical region, like um, cotton and the rest of them. So these are the environmental, environmental factors, how environmental factors, how you should analyze environmental factors. So let's look at the analysis here. The PESO analysis tree here. Looking at it here, you can see economic factor, political factor, these are branches social factor, environmental factor, technology, legal. Under economic factor, you can see market condition, unemployment rate, retirement age, inflation rate, currency exchange rate, spending pattern, customer access to credit. You're looking at political factors. You're looking at uh, government stability, corruption level, organized crime level, threat of war, legislation, nationalization, political stability, import and export restriction, tariffs and taxation, corporate social responsibilities, labor law, labor laws and uh, policies. So you are looking at technology, looking at uh, new technology development, automation maturity, copyright and piracy law, software licensing, protection and security, working remotely, access to basic infrastructure, social media trend, e-commerce trend, workforce competence. These are technological factors. So we're looking at social factors. We're looking at uh, cultural barrier. We're looking at gender distribution. 
we're looking at uh, age distribution, demographic, social welfare program, attitude towards work, literacy level, education level, language skill, health, uh, consciousness, health status, life uh, style trend. These are social factors that can affect your project or your business. So you should uh, look at the one that is affecting your project and your business before um, diving into the business or know how to control or manage it within that environment. Looking at legal factors, you see international and national standards. We uh, look at um, discrimination level law. We look at um, advertising law, antitrust and bribery law, local government by law, customer protection law, product safety law, and the product labeling law. These are all the laws within legal uh, factors. And that's how you can use PESO to manage, um, do proper analysis. So any question on personal analysis? Then we move to risk management techniques using a red lock. Red lock serves as a central repository for all risk assumption issue dependencies related to a project. It allows project managers and team members to keep track of their projects. It's very good for audit purposes. So looking at this uh, read dashboard, this is where we capture all the risk. And this is where we capture all the assumptions. And this is where we capture all the issues. And then here, dependencies. And this is where we measure their impact. From this one, from this uh, zero, that's critical to high, to moderate, to low, to negligible, these are the impacts where we do the impact analysis, the risk impact analysis within all this uh, uh, read, which is a uh, read is for R is for risk, A is for assumption, and I for issue and D for dependency. That's the full full meaning of read. So this is the, the, the dashboard. Then how do we do the read itself? Here is how we capture it. Here we decide whether it's an issue or whether it's an assumption or whether it's a risk or whether it's a dependency. So when we capture, we decide, on that read, we decide which one we are capturing. For instance, here is issue. We captured it on that issue. We describe the issue we captured. Like you can see here, the issue here is that vendor master data is outdated. So, and under the impact here, the impact is not stated here. And the owner is not stated. The owner has not been assigned. We have not assigned owner to, <coughs> to this particular issue. And the issue here 
under the issue of prioritization is a very low um, in terms of uh, rating is very low and there is no uh, no point here there's no risk point here or rate point so is under here you can see the status the status means whether it's open whether it's closed so once the issue is resolved you close it but you can see here all the all the all our read uh both the issue the risk the assumption All the risk activity here, they are all open. And now let's see, look at this risk. The risk here is long supply delivery time, meaning that the time it takes to make delivery is long and is not good for business because if it's coming, taking this long or coming this late is going to affect our business. So the impact here is on project schedule or let's say project timeline. So if, if we are getting it from a vendor, for instance, if we are looking at vendor that are going to supply the material we are going to use and the, we are, the our project is within within two weeks, or this particular deliverable is within two weeks. And they are saying that they are, it's going to take from their website, we can see that it's going to take them one week to make delivery to us. You can see this is going to be a risk because it's going to take half of our time. So we need to look for a vendor that can deliver within one day or next day delivery. So that is how you, you manage it. How do we manage this particular, it's, you can see it's very critical. And the, the, the point here is 50 and it's open. We've not assigned this particular risk to any owner. So we look at someone within our project team who have very good, no, um, uh vendor management knowledge or vendor management skill and assign the person this particular risk to manage and as a project manager you need to collaborate with the owner to make sure that you monitor the risk management and before this as a project manager you must have a, a risk management uh, template on how you manage your risk so this is what you do. So when the person manages the risk, you monitor the person. And once this risk has been resolved, you close it. And a risk, if it's not managed very well, it can be reopened. Any of this one, any close, any of these statues that have been closed can equally be reopened. If, if, if not well managed. So that's how you use a red log to capture all the hazard dangers within the project and document them and manage them properly. Any question on red log? Elisa. Okay. Is, uh, I need explanation on the assumption uh, on the assumption part. Okay, assumptions are the things that you assume that should happen within the the project. For instance, you assume that your project, if it's a, you have a timeline of. Uh, like this approach, you have a timeline of three months to complete 
whatever we are doing here. That's our timeline. So when you are managing your read on this particular activity, a timeline is assume that you are going to finish this project within three months. That's our assumption. So how we capture the assumption. So, but if this assumption, you find out that within three months, which is assumptions, we assume we are going to do, do, do this, uh, finish this within three months. And we find out that we can't finish this project within these uh, three months. Then it becomes, before you, when we, when we start looking at, when you start the, 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 the closing date is coming closer, and it's becoming glaring that we cannot finish this. It becomes a risk. We can see our timeline, looking at what we have, like we have uh, so many things to do, we have not done it, and becomes a risk. And at the end of the, the three months, and we've not finished this project, then becomes a serious issue, becomes an issue. Can you see how they progress from one stage to another stage? Hello? Yes, I'm here. So, so that is an assumption. So when we are, when we are managing your, your, your project, you capture every deliverable based on where they're supposed to belong. You manage them. So you have all the assumptions, everything you assume that is supposed to happen within the project, you capture them under assumption. So assumption means that it can actually uh, happen. You are not certain, you are not sure. You can't tell. Um, you can't say that authoritatively, but this is what we assume based on uh, what you've got on the table. <clears throat> so that is assumptions. That's how you capture assumptions. Okay. Yeah. okay. So the next thing is the uh, requirements elicitation techniques. What we are going to uh, look at here is an interview. Interview is a common technique for eliciting requirements. It involves direct communication with individuals or group of people who are part of an initiative. The interviewer directs questions to stakeholders in order to obtain information. One-on-one -on -one interview are <clears throat> the most common. So how do we conduct interview? First, start by clearly define the purpose of the interview. Then identify the targets respondent for the interview. Within this, when we've done your, your stakeholder, analysis. So you must have identified stakeholders that you really need to interview, to understand your requirements. So that's how you identify the target respondent through your stakeholder analysis or stakeholder documents you've already uh, documented. Then prepare a list of questions prior to the uh, interview. Your question should come in three form, in three segments, or in three parts. The first part of your question should be to understand the aims and objective of the of the project. 
to understand the problem statement. What are the problems the company facing? Because as a business analyst, you know you're here to solve problems. So you must understand the problem the company or the organization is facing. And then how, what do they tend to achieve? That is the objective. Then you must, have, after understanding the problem and the, the objective, what they are trying to achieve by solving that particular problem. The next thing is you understand the way they do their business within that context, within that environment, within that project. If it's a process we are trying to improve for the organization, then you understand the process. Try to uh, get a question that will help you to understand the process. Let's say the um, e-commerce is an e-commerce, um, or is a, is a, a supermarket that is complaining that uh, they are not making enough sales. Maybe they want to add another layer onto what they are there, the level the business they are doing in order to increase their sales and profitability. So they are operating on offline, offline basis, and now maybe they want to go online. So the first thing is to understand the way they do that, they are they are offline supermarket business? How do they um, sell to their customers? How do they interact with their customers? How do customers uh, perform? You know, what does customers perform in order to buy a product? What are the activities a customer needs to undergo in order to buy a product? You must understand all these things. That is, that is the, the current process or you call it ASIS. ASIS is a jargon. So then the, the, the next level or the next stage you need to understand is the ideal situation they are looking at when their problem is being solved. That is target, target um, uh, or future states or target states or to be. So that's three sections your question should come under. And your question should be open-ended questions. Open-ended question means that you should be able to explore the respondents. If you use closed question, the, 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 the respondent will just say yes or no, which might not be good enough for you. We will not really explore uh, or help you to investigate the process very well. So you should try as much as you can to use an open-ended question so that the respondent should be able to talk more on the subject. Okay, okay, so what are examples of open-ended questions? Oh, open-ended question is, um, it can be, how do you, like I've said in commerce now, you can, you can ask the, the respondent, how do you engage your customers? Now you've asked the question that we, uh prompt the respondent to then tell you how the respondent engage customers engaging a customer is that is the detail though it cannot it cannot end in yes or no you know that yes that's true so with that we're able to tell you uh, how i engage my customer when a customer comes um 
uh, I will tell the customer to pick up a basket or I will tell the customer to wear a, a face mask and then I will direct the customer where to pick a basket or a shopping trolley. And then the customer, well, I will ask the customer if the customer need assistance, if the customer doesn't need assistance, or if you need assistance, I'll assist, assist the customer on where to pick the product. And after then, after picking the, the customer, I will um, direct the customer to the tail where the customer will um, check out and then make payment. See, that is how you now ask how do you engage a customer with that. You see, with that, you've explored the respondents uh, very well on how to engage customer. So then uh, after that, you decide the type of um, interview uh, you are going to use. There are so many ways of uh, doing interview. It can be a one-on-one -on -one interview. It can be a workshop where you face um, so many respondents at the same time. So you decide which one you are going to use. Is either one-on-one -on -one or you use a workshop. Then decide the data capturing a method. So it can be a form, questionnaire, taking notes, or ETC. It means I can, while the, the, the question, the, 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 interview, the, the interview is going on or the workshop is going on, you can be taking notes. Or ETC, you can be recording, just like what we are doing like this. After recording, you can then extract the requirement. Then you have to contact the respondent before the interview and let them know the date for the interview. Do a pilot interview to refine the questions and the interview process. So you must prepare yourself with a pilot interview, maybe a colleague or a fellow business analyst within your team. You do a pilot interview, the person, you can just um, do a pilot interview with your co um, or, to, or a team member to help you refine the, the interview uh, question. Then con Conduct the interview at the scheduled time or date. It's equally good to send um, a reminder to the respondent or the stakeholder, maybe a day to the interview, to make sure they are still uh, uh, coming or attending the interview. Just a gentle reminder. And then on the day of interview, you conduct the, the interview. Let the question, let the question structure the conservation be adapted to the discussion as needed. Take notes or record interview in order to capture the conversation. You see what happened last time we, we, we had this um, lecture, we didn't, um, we didn't record, we didn't capture this, uh, this um, lecture and that's why we're capture. We, we are doing it again. If maybe what I did is an interview with a stakeholder, a high level stakeholder, maybe a CEO, after two hours of interview and I didn't record it. And then I start telling the stakeholder that I want another interview on this particular topic again, that's going to be very difficult. You know, you, you see the way the stakeholder is going to look at me as a very, very, um, as an unserious business analyst. And that might even affect your job. So it's very, very important that 
you record your interview or you capture your interview. So you, you must have a, a plan where you, you atomize what you need to do. And everyone you've done, you tick it. So that will help you not to forget any, any stage of the interview, like record if you if you have listed it that on the agenda you need to record this interview you need to capture notes when it's time to start the first thing you see record so you tick make sure that you record so these are some of the things it might look so common or it might look so small but it can spoil the whole day for you or spoil the whole activities or all your efforts so it's, it's very good you record or capture your interview. Listen, don't interrupt. Make the participant feel comfortable and be respectful of boundaries. You know, at times so during interview, we we'll try to, you know, be, be friendly and be social and we'll start venturing into uh, personal, uh, private life, you know, just trying to make the, the respondent or the stakeholder feel happy that you are a friendly person. You might, you can, you don't know, you might be crossing your boundaries. You know, when during the interview, there is no need of asking the respondent, um, are you married? Or do you have a boyfriend? Why should you do that? That can be maybe if the person is not married or if the person is having an issue with the boyfriend, you can might actually be opening an, um, a wound which might trigger the person and spoil the, the mood of the whole interview. So you don't need to venture into a private life. Be as professional as you can. Before completing, interview, ask the respondent for additional inputs or comments. Be because you have, um, you are the one who wrote your, um, wrote your questions. It might be that all the questions you've actually composed, you've not really hit the nail. What the, the respondent, the information the respondent or the stakeholder want to give to you. You might just um, scratch it from the, the surface within your own knowledge. So by the time you, you ask this question, give the respondent the opportunity to make an input or comment freely, then he might even bring in a requirement that is not within your questions that he want you to capture, want you to know. And that's how this has been beneficial by asking this question. But if you do not ask, give the, the respondent this opportunity to make more valuable uh, input or comment, you might just end there. And maybe over time, you find out that um, you have incomplete requirements. So, Take time to document important ideas and findings soon after completing the interview. So immediately after completing the interview, document it and send it back to the respondent for validation. Or oh, yes, they need to validate your, the interview results to make sure that what you captured is what they impute. At times you might be writing, you you might be capturing the wrong things. So it's during the validation that the, the, the stakeholder will say, okay, actually this is what I impute during the interview and the, yeah, this is the requirement I want. Then you start making use of the requirement. But if there is a, a, a mistake, this is the time to make corrections and then move on to your requirement analysis.
So. Then let's look at um, survey and questionnaire as a technique for requirement elicitation. A survey or questionnaire presents a set of questions to stakeholders and subject matter experts. Their response are then collected and analyzed in order to formulate knowledge about the subject matter of interest. So like we know survey or questionnaires, they prepare a question uh, for them to uh, make an input can do most of the time, this can be done online, can use the online to capture, although we, we can equally use a, a paper questionnaire, but most these days, most of the survey or questionnaire have been done online. The, the respondent will just log in and then complete the form, and which will help you to generate the data you are looking for. Basic rules when writing questionnaires. Avoid making assumption about the respondent. So you try to be as, as uh, practical as possible. Use short questions. Long questionnaires will result in decrease participation. If you are using, um, if you want a detailed um, input from, from stakeholders, it's better to use a one-on-one -on -one interview or, or, or workshop. Because so many, so many stakeholders might not have the patience to start typing longer or detail. No, most of them will just um, short, short, or yes or no. That's what they will be looking at. Or yes, that's how questionnaire. So if you, if if it's, it's longer, um, if you are looking for a longer description, it might ruin the mood of the participant. Use clear, easily understandable wording for all educational level. So you try as much as you can to use a um, uh, very straightforward um, language. Don't be too technical, like using a, a stakeholders, um, I mean, a business analysis uh, uh, jargons like Aziz to be. The stakeholders might not really understand what is Aziz or what is to be. So avoid using um, jargons. Some stakeholders might not understand what is the user stories. They don't understand, yeah. So you don't assume that, uh, like I say, avoid uh, making assumptions. Don't assume that they know what is um, uh, as is and they, they should know what is to be. Actually, I don't know what is as is and what is to be until I started uh, working as a business analyst. Use positive statements and avoid asking emotional questions, just like I, I said in the during the interview. Emotional questions, these are, can be uh, personal or private um, questions. So you don't need to do that. Try to be professional as much as you can, official. Questions should not be biased or leading the uh, participant towards an answer. So let the let the 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 the, the, the participant give an honest opinion of an issue. Don't precondition the 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 answer. If you are preconditioning the answer, actually, then you know what you you've already 
there's no need for the for the questionnaire or the survey because you already know what you wanted. Remember to include contextual questions. Yes, not every question needs to be yes or no. At least put some question for them to make some input. Avoid questioning more than one question per item. Yes, there is no need for repetition. And the questionnaire with a broad open-ended question such as, is there anything else you would like to say? Yes, give them opportunity to make their own input. And uh, that is um, how you can use a survey or questionnaire to gather your requirement or your data. Any question at this point? Yeah, okay, we move. Now we move to process analysis as a technique uh, in requirement um, analysis. Now we've um, we've got, gathered our requirements, captured our requirements. It's time to do <clears throat> our analysis. Process analysis assess a process for its efficiency and effectiveness, as well as its ability to identify opportunities for change. Process analysis used for various uh, purposes include recommending a more efficient or effective process, determining the gap between the current and the future state of process, understanding factors to be included in a central negotiation, understanding how data and technology are used in a process and analyzing the impact of a pending change to a process. Framework and methodology that focus on process analysis are Six Sigma and Lean. These are the most common approach or framework where we use um, process analysis. Because mainly, like in Six Sigma, mainly Six Sigma is focused on a, a process improvement. And Lean mainly focuses on waste reduction within a process. So now process model can be used to describe the contents of the solution or part of the solution. Describe what actually happened or is desired to happen during the process. Provide an understanding, understandable description of a sequence of activity to an external observer and uh, provide a visual, a visual to accompany a text description and provide a basis for a process analysis. Process model generally include the participants in the process, the business event that triggers the process, the step or activities of the process, both manual and automated, the flow and decision points that logically link both uh, those activities and result of the process. So that's um, how use a process analysis. 
And this process analysis, how do we do that? Mainly after gathering our requirements and document our requirement, then we map the process using uh, tools like uh, softwares like uh, Visio, um, Lucid Charts, uh, Draw.io. That's what we use to map our process using some techniques like process map and um, uh, flow charts. Process map and flow charts, these are the most common uh, techniques we use within process mapping. During uh, using a um, uh, lane, we use a value stream map. It's still a process map technique. So, but the the process map we are going to look at is um, the process modeling we are going to look at is process map. So many, uh, so many of the times, um, uh, flow charts uh, equally come so handy. But for the purpose of this um, training, what we are going to use is a process map. And this is what um, so many organizations are using uh, for their process modeling. So that is, is what we are going to be doing. And this is where your, your assignment comes from. So the assignment here centers on process mapping, mapping out the current process, mapping out the, the gap, identifying the gap within the current process, and then mapping out the future process. So if you understand this very well, then you are now becoming a good business analyst. Once you can document, your, once you can gather your requirement from the stakeholders, document your requirements, then map it out, map the, the current process, find out the, 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 the gap, that is the problem within the, the current uh, process, and then solve that problem within the current process then you are a business analyst. So let's look at the current process here. This is the current process. Um, an organization, a real estate company is using to solve their problem, the customer's problem. And the customer problem here the, the problem their customer is having, let's look at the problem from the start. This process, we use swim lane diagram to do this process map. And what is swim lane diagram? Swim lane means that every operator have within this process or every department or every unit within this process have their own lane, their own parallel lane. Everybody is on their own lane. So you see when a process is entering from one department to another department, or from one unit to another unit, or from one operator to another operator. So that's how swim lane gives you the, the visibility of how different departments collaborate in doing in solving one problem or managing one process so this particular problem the organization solving this customer problem together so it's not one person that is solving this problem so when you are making a complaint to an organization your, your input might trigger to so many other people. They can be your, your input or your complaint can be escalated to five departments or five operators of different support level 
that will handle that particular uh, process or that uh, complaint or that particular activity before finally they resolve that particular and get back to you. And to do that, using this um, illustration, you can see here the customer, which is the, the tenant, identify and report an incident of foil, uh, faulty boiler in his or her apartment, and then reports to the company or real estate help desk officer. The help desk officer received and logged the incident and then contact the landlord who owns the property they are managing to let the landlord know there is a fault, a fault within the property they are managing for him. And then the landlord um approve that okay um do what you need to do to resolve the the faulty boiler and then after receiving the approval the help desk then contacts the plumber to let the plumber know there is a faulty uh, plumbing unit within the real estate and the plumber then visit the size for assessment. After assessing the faulty boiler, find out that there is a, uh, a faulty unit within the boiler that needs to be changed. The plumber then moves straight to the store man to pick the uh, papers. And after then goes back to the uh, facility to fix the boiler, the, the faulty boiler, and after fixing the faulty boiler, conduct a text to make sure that it's working. After conducting the functional test and everything working fine, then report back to help desk to do paperwork. And the, the help desk complete the paperwork, then calls the, the customer to confirm that the incident has been resolved. And the customer say yes. The, the 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 boiler is now working well and now they close the the process and that's the end of the process so but this particular process is the problem this is where the problem lies the problem lies here is that it takes longer time to resolve this process Let's say it's taking them one week to resolve this um, issue. And customer, the, the tenant, they are not happy that it's taking this long because boiler is a very vital, uh, a very vital instrument within the um, within the home so no one can live here in the uk no one can live for one week without boiler working properly because every time you you bath you need to boil water you need your boiler to get on and if the boiler is not working even the gas they cannot hit the house and everything is grounded so how can someone survive in, um, in winter period for one week without a boiler? So that's why they all they are complaining. So when there is a faulty boiler, within two days, it should be sorted out. But here, it's not happening that way. So that's the problem. It's taking too long. Customers, the, uh, the tenants are complaining. So now you as a business analyst, they've hired you, you've gathered the requirements, you've mapped out the process, the assist process map here. Then you do a, it's time to, for you to do analysis. You do analysis and the analysis you are doing here, you use gap analysis. Gap analysis, you decide, you, you find out the gap between the current process and the 
the desired process. And in order to, we are talking about time here. So what you need to do is to fish out some of the unwanted process here that's um, wasting the time. So you need to find, fish out the unwanted process that becomes a waste of time here. And from your analysis, as a business analyst, within your, your own knowledge, you believe that removing the landlord's activity within this process is going to be the ideal process to, to reduce time. And then that's why here you highlighted the activities that involve landlord within the uh, wonder is not locked. So that's why you you highlighted the problems here. You feel that this is a waste of time, and you have to. You feel that once this um all these processes that are not adding value within this uh, process flow need to be removed in order to save time. And that's what we are doing. And now after mapping out, after removing the, the, the unwanted processes, now you get, that bring us to the desired process or the target uh, process or to be. Now we have um, at least removing the activities of landlord because at times it can take time to contact, to contact the landlord, maybe two days. So um, if contacting the landlord, the landlord might take time to get back to you. All these things can take a total of, let's say two days or three days. So if you are removing that from the whole one week, that can save us like three days, bringing the, 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 the duration for resolving this process to four days. That is something you've done for the organization. So you can actually use the time to, do, to solve one problem to actually solve two problems. And so if you have, a, 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 let's say 10 people within the queue waiting to be addressed, you can bring down the time, the whole thing to, uh, to 50% or 40% improvement within the, the organization. And as a business analyst, that's a lot you've achieved for the organization. <clears throat> any, pro, any, any question on process analysis? Okay, then we move. These are other um, other case studies on process um, analysis where one well, well, might not go into details. On this, just for you to see the process, how it's mapped out. Here is um, handling customers' complaint just like what we did earlier using, the other one is um, real estate, but here just handling customer's complaint. Here you receive, you receive customer complaint, record customer complaint, communicate internally, then you get the fact, then analyze the complaint, prepare anal analysis reports, send analysis report, offer solution, through compensation for any loss, close complaint and internally display analysis reports, meet or review complaint uh, status quarterly. So this is another way to use a process map. You can see here, we don't have any swim lane here. It's just a, a classic um, 
process map. So another one here, you can see that why, why I decided to bring this uh, so many process map is that you can see that process map or process modeling or somebody in a, a business analyst who is specialized in process modeling is called process analyst. And there is so many jobs out there for process analysts. So if you are looking for business analyst job and you see um, a vacancy, said process analyst, you can apply for it because it's a business analyst, but they are specialized in process modeling. Just like some business anal analysts will be specializing in data analysis. For a business analyst, you have special knowledge of data. You see, see, you see data analyst job. You can apply. You are still a business analyst job. So you, if you searching for a job now, you see process analysis, you say, no, no, I don't, I'm not qualified. That is meant for is for business analysis, but just that you specialize in process analysis. And you can see that process analysis is everywhere. You can be in so organization, they are looking for a lot of process analysis to so help them document their processes. If you come to an organization, they might have hundreds of processes in different departments. They are looking for people to help them organize, map out those processes. You can see here is a hotel check-in, a hotel check-out process. You know, they want to map out hotel process um, check-out and from there to see how to improve on their check-out system. They equally have a check-in uh, process. So there are so many processes, but we're not going to dive into this one. You can, on your own, study it and see how it works. So any question on process map or process modeling as a technique? OK, if you don't have any question, we move to, we move to root, cause, um, root cause analysis. And we are going to use a fishbone diagram. A fishbone diagram is used to identify the source of variation from well, within a process. It helps to identify the root cause, root causes of a problem, or it helps to identify the effect of the problem in order to identify the appropriate solution. So this is a root cause analysis. And then root cause analysis means that uh, there is a problem. You can't just solve the problem just uh, tactically. So you need to look at a problem from um, from strategic point of view. And to look at a problem from strategic point of view, you must ascertain the root cause of that problem. That's the only way you can solve the problem. If you're solving problem tactically, you just solve the immediate problem, but the, the, the root cause of the problem, you've not addressed it. And that is not good. It's not, um, it's not strategic, it's not cost effective because if you don't uproot the, the root cause, you, the problem will keep on resurfacing after tactically solving the problem. So, and to do that, fishbone diagram is one of the best uh, way to do root cause analysis. We call it fishbone diagram because it has the feature of a fishbone. That's where the name comes, just because of it looks like fishbone. Like this is the head of this diagram, and this is the, the bone, and yeah, you can see it looks like a fishbone. So 
The main reason behind this full fishbone diagram is to look at the cause and the effect of a problem. So that is it. So looking at here, this is the, the problem here is the increased invoice error. That is the effect. Effect is the problem. And what is causing this? What is causing this effect, which is the um, increased invoice error, which is the problem? Look, let's look at the cost. The cost from these six factors, method factor, equipment factor, environment factor, material factor, measure factor, and man factor. So that's how we are going to find out the cause of this increased error in our invoice. So when you come to an, a company, a lot of customers are seeing that there is a lot of error when you are trying to balance um, or, or do, um, what do you call it? Um, um invoice um to resolve the invoice or do bank have bank reconciliation when you want to do a bank reconciliation and you find out there is a lot of errors within the invoice when you are posting all this uh, invoice within the maybe you are using a uh, sales um uh, sap uh, or let me say siege system, you are posting all this invoice within the um, within the what they call it within the accounting section. Account uh, yeah within the account receivable and account payable, and you find out there is a lot of. Um, errors that can really mess the whole data up because the data is no longer going to be accurate. The, 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 the decision from this can be biased because there's a lot of errors. So, which is a very big problem within the organization, within the accounting department. So how do you resolve this issue to make sure that we don't receive this kind a lot of errors within the accounting department coming from their invoice. So let's look at the method they are using to um, to capture their invoice. Looking from the uh, method, we find out that is a two cumbersome a process. And now you can see that they are using manual data entry. At this point, most organizations don't use manual data entry when it comes to accounting in order to, re to reduce errors. Manual data is beginning to, uh, beginning to phase out manual data beginning to automate most of the activities within um, uh, within accounting department to reduce error. But as you can see here, they are still using manual data entry. And that's why it's uh, causing this problem. Then let's look at uh, the problem from the equipment point of view. Now, looking at the equipment they are using, you find out they have inadequate printers. They don't have enough printers and system. Uh, they are having a system integration pro uh, problem. They find out that their systems are not properly integrated. So if their system are not integrated, how do they communicate their data from one department to another? It's not, it's, it's not working. So you see the problem they're having here. The system is not integrated because 
you see incompatibility of their system. Their system are not compatible. And because their system are not compatible, that's why they are finding system to integrate their system. So the, the whole, the IT department is in a mess. So in order to solve this, they need to, to make sure that they are, um, they have compatible systems. They are using within the IT department that can be integrated very well for seamless data um, communication. Then look at environment where they are doing their job, where they are working. They have poor ignometics. Their environment is very, very poor. Everywhere there is high level of noise, noise coming from the office. So these are distracting workers within the, 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 the accounting department because of the high level of noise. Then let's look at the materials they are using to do this job. Okay, in terms of materials here, they have delay paper supply. Even the papers they are using to work within the, 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 finance, the accounting department, they don't supply it on time. And even if they, they, they supply the, 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 the materials, the papers are of poor quality, of which that if you want to print, they, they can't print very well. Then we're looking at the, the measurement, the audit department, where they, they, they measure and they do control terms of uh, process uh, control. There is poor control measures. There is poor audit system. You know, nobody cares about the way they do their work. There is no control, no quality assurance uh, control here. Everything is just in a mess. Then let's look at the, the, the man. Man here means the personnel, the human resources. The, kind, the quality of human resources they are using. That's what we mean by a man here. You see, low morale. Their morale is very low because this can be because um, for three months now, they have not paid them salaries. So they are, they are, they are very, they have low morale. They are not happy. And increased workload. You see one person, um, can do the work of um, five people. They don't want to employ uh, enough personnel. They are over laboring one person within the, 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 the office and they are not even paying the person. So how do you expect the person to, 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 to impute an um, effective and efficient service? And poor technical support. This technical support is poor. So this is how you use a fishbone diagram to capture the root cause of the problem within finance department, finance and account department that is causing increased invoice in um, increased invoice errors. That is a increased data data error. So this is it. Uh, that's how to use um, fishbone analysis techniques, a fishbone diagram to do root cause analysis in the requirement analysis. So any problem in root cause analysis, there's other, other analysis you can see use in a root cause analysis. You have a YY techniques, you know, but we are going to, this is what we are going to be using, a fishbone diagram. It's more popular within the industry. Now we're going to look at uh, gap analysis as a technique. A gap is a problem, issue, 
or challenge and could be an opportunity for improvement. Gap analysis compares two different states of something, the current state and the desired state. Yeah, we've treated the gap analysis during um, process map, but that's as a process with the process map, not as a gap analysis. So now we're looking at a um, gap analysis as its own techniques. So looking at it from this diagram, you can see here we are working from the current standing to the objective or the requirement. And between the current standing and the objective is gap. That is the deficiency. And looking from it from the assist point of view, moving to the to be, that is the action that we need to perform. And the action we need to perform is to fix this gap, fix this deficiency. So that is the simplest way to um, describe this uh, gap analysis. Let's look at this example here, using a restaurant as a case study. Looking at the problem the restaurant is facing, what is the problem? The restaurant, the customers complain that the food takes too long to be served. And what is the current situation? How are they serving? How long does it take to serve a food that these customers are complaining that is too is taking too long? The food takes on average of 14 minutes to be served. That is the current situation. So what is the desired situation so that we can know the gap in the system? The desired situation for the restaurant is that the food should be served within 11 minutes of ordering. That is within 11 minutes, the food should be serving and it's taking 14 minutes and customers are complaining. So what is the gap here? Because it's very, very specific. The current state is 14 minutes and the desired state is 11 minutes. So the gap here is three minutes. How do we fix this gap? How do we re remove these three minutes within the current state to get this to get to this desired state. That is the action or the requirement. That is what we need to, to do. And to get there, first, we need to obtain more opinion from customers about their experience. So within their experience, they'll understand that actually they are happy if we can be actually serving the food within 11 minutes. Okay, so we have to work towards that. Then we need to, because it's not only the customers, because customers are the stakeholders here as well. So we need to find out from them what makes them happy. And this is what we call customer journey, you know, customer opinion. This is pure agile methodology obtaining um gathering requirement from customers to know their, their, their experience within our product then, uh, or our services. Then now we've gathered the requirement from the customers, then we need to look at our employees to find out. So ask employees what would help them provide faster customer service. No, we find out that um, most of them are not, uh, there's maybe some of the um, equipment we procured uh, within our restaurant and within the kitchen that our, our this thing, our, their, our customers, our, our cook, or our employees, they don't know how to use it. For instance, maybe our, our cook, they have been using um, 
oil fryer to fry some of the food or some of the fries we serve to the customers. And now we've made some new procurement where we are using a air fryer where we don't use oil again. Now, some of them, they don't know how to use this air fryer. So it's taking them time to understand this. They don't really know how to use some of the equipment we procured during our uh, improvement, kitchen improvement. And this is why it's taking time for them to process the food because we are no longer using the equipment they are used to. So what do we do? We train employees to provide faster service. So we bring professionals that will teach them how to use this equipment faster. So and the moment they master how to use all these uh, new kitchen equipment, the services will then improve. So that's how we do gap analysis. Any question at this point? Hmm. I can see so, so many of you have started sleeping already. <laughs> okay. The next thing we're going to do here is um, requirement prioritization a technique using a Moscow analysis. Moscow is derived from four prioritization categories. And these are must have within a, a, a requirement, the, require, the, 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 the requirements a project or a solution must have. Then S is should have, and C is could have, and W is won't have. So developer will deliver all the must have, should have and could have, but should and could will be the first to be removed if the delivery time is threatened. So when you um, prioritize your requirement using Moscow analysis, and handed them over to the developers. This is the order of uh, importance of this requirement. So if the timeline is being threatened, yes, the developers are meant to deliver all the requirements, but in a situation that developers could not deliver all, all the requirements within the time specified, and we must deliver something to the stakeholders, as the uh, scrum guide stipulated. So we must deliver minimum viable um, solution or quality or software to the develop to the stakeholders. So if we find ourselves in a threatened position, then we must deliver the most have and will drop the could, the should and could have. So that is it. That's how we use um, uh, Moscow analysis. Most are non-negotiables. On that most, these are non-negotiable. Minimum viable products can be delivered on target dates without this not legal without, without it, unsafe without it, without this project is uh, not, uh, without this project is not viable. So this is uh, a no-go area. This is, it must be delivered. So ask the question, what happened 
if this requirement is not met. If the requirement is canceled, the project, there is no point implementing a solution that does not meet this requirement. So if this requirement is not met, then it means that the project should be canceled. So this should be the, the nucleus of this project. You can't do anything without this particular requirement. Then we talk about should have under our prioritization. Important, but not vital. May be painful to leave out, but the solution is still viable. May need some kind of uh, work around. It should have maybe different from a could have by reviewing the degree of pain caused by, by it not being met. In terms of business value or number of uh, people affected. So this, if we don't meet up with this requirement under this uh, should have, it should be painful, but doesn't mean that the project cannot go, the project can still go. And the difference between this should have and could have is the level of pain. So desired, all that could have is desirable, but not important as should have. Only do it if there is extra time and budgets. So you just do it if you have a, an a extra time and budget. Okay, we'll come to won't have. Won't have this time around at all. Out of budget is not within our budget. Nice to have, but has no real impact. So these are some of the um, deliverable we are not uh, looking at. For instance, in our e-commerce um, application, a block system is very good, but for now, we don't have a budget for block system to be integrating block system in our e-commerce site is nice to have, but yeah, we don't have uh, such resources for now. So we're not uh, considering it is a won't have, so block canceled. Um, payment gateway is uh, we have a, um, if a, a flutter wave or pay start payment is a must have because if we don't have this payment gateway, there is no way our, our customers can make payments within our e-commerce website. So it's a must have. So then adding um, another payment system, like where customers can make payments offline, uh, paying directly to bank our bank account and then screenshotting and sending to us is good. Having offline payment system within our e-commerce system. But yeah, if we, only if we have enough resources and time to do that. But if we don't have it, yes, it's going to be painful, but can still continue with um, our flutter wave and pay stack payment gateway and still be doing our business. So this is how you can actually do your requirements prioritization before you start your project. So the next thing here, we are going to look into is um, requirement analysis, um, brainstorming section.
Brainstorming is a group activity that is meant to generate large number of ideas. So now using brainstorming session, you have a problem and within your group, you people need to brainstorm ideas on how to solve that problem as a team. And during brainstorming session, you allot yourself a time period for every person to brainstorm on solution, write them down and submit within the group for review and come up with the best solution. Looking at this um, diagram, the problem here is that the streets are really dirty and full of trash. And there are so many brainstorming ideas here on how to uh, tackle the problem of dirty street, uh, dirty street. So let's look at one of these um, brainstorming solution, brainstormed solution. What are the behaviors? We need to start from looking at the behavior that causes the this problem. What behaviors or behavior or factors, behaviors or factors that causes this problem? What are the behaviors that causes this problem? People leave large items such as furniture on the street. These are actions that causes this, makes the street to be filthy. Then what are the solutions? Give out tickets for leaving these items on the street. Then what rules or habits that causes this? People do not know how to properly dispose of large items such as furniture or do not feel like scheduling a pickup solution. Make make it easy, easier for people to get rid of these items by starting a service that will come up, will come and pick them up from people's home. So when you start a service, where well, when people have a, a such, um, such big items to dispose, then maybe the council will come to their home and pick up this um, large item. It's going to reduce the issue of uh, leaving uh, large items such as furniture on the street. These are one of these uh, brainstorming sessions. And you can see so, there are so many of these uh, brainstorming ideas here. So that's how you can brainstorm solutions as a team, more especially, for instance here, if you've gathered your requirements and you are looking for a solution, you can brainstorm on so many ideas. Let's use, we have been using e-commerce as a um, case study. Let's say we want to implement an e-commerce um, web app for our client. And after our analysis, we find out that actually what our client need at this point in their business is to add another layer to their way of doing business, to their services, to their customers, which is on top of their offline business, offline, offline uh, business to add e-commerce, which is online. So, but now we don't know which solution to use. E-commerce have so many solutions and so many vendors. And for us to pick one, we need to brainstorm so many e-commerce. So well, how do we do that? We we'll start researching, looking at different e-commerce solutions like say um, Shopify, we have um, cloud commerce, we have um, SAP Commerce Cloud, we have Salesforce, 
commerce. We have um, we have WooCommerce. So by the time we have generated all these um, uh, all these solutions through brainstorming, we have a lot of solutions now. We have generated during our brainstorming session. But how do we select one out of all these solutions we have now um, generated during brainstorming session? So that will bring us to the next session, which is a solution evaluation. Solution evaluation include the process of, to validate a full solution or a segment of a solution that is about to, to be or has already been implemented. Evaluation determine how well a solution meets the business need expressed by stakeholders, including delivering value to the customers. Now that we've um, brainstormed on the solutions, now we need to evaluate the solution. That's called solution evaluation to make sure that they meet the requirements. That's going to be the criteria for choosing a particular solution. And to do that, we are going to use acceptance criteria defined by the stakeholders. These are the, the acceptance criteria we are going to use. And looking at this diagram, on the acceptance criteria, we have cost. This solution must come within the budget we have. Now, we like for instance, if you have ten thousand pounds budget, so out of all these uh, e-commerce solutions we've um, enumerated, we must look at those that come within that ten thousand budget, and then we look at performance. Performance of the look at performance of this solution. We look at uh, usability. And we look at functionalities, means that this solution have all the functionalities we desire in a solution and is within this cost. And we, the, the ease of uh, deployment. So any of this solution that comes within this acceptance criteria is going to be the solution we are going to use for the, for the project. So we have defined requirements, requirement that must be met in order for solution to be considered. So that is how we do requirement uh, evaluation to select the solution we need. This is if we have one solution. But in case we have multiple solution, then we probably need to uh, look at ranking of different solutions. How are they ranked in terms of value? These are things we need to, to look at in order to consider a particular solution. That's how we do solution evaluation. And to do this evaluation, it's going to be tough to do that if we want to do it on our own just like that. But we have so many um so many sites or, or vendors or consultancy that can help us um, do that during solution evaluation we we'll look at uh, can you probably use a gartner or other website that will help us to to do the analysis Gartner is one of the best websites for analyzing various softwares or various solutions to pick one, the best out of them, looking at their various, way, uh, various ways of doing their analysis. If we're looking at, um, for instance, we want um, an e-commerce solution. Here you can see commerce solution. Here you see, um, 
Shopify, you see my ghetto for Adobe, and so many of them. So that's how we use Gartner to analyze our solution. Uh, let's look at Gartner. No, we don't have time. But I say let's look at Gartner to see how Gartner works. But if you go to Gartner.com, if you any kind of so if you are looking for a e-commerce solution, just type e-commerce solution or digital or pick one e-commerce solution. You bring out all the e-commerce solution for you to to choose. And to choose, you look at their their rating, their ranking, and you can compare um, two solutions against the alternative uh, solutions within the Gartner to make a choice of uh, the best solution that meets your, your requirement. That's how we use Gartner um, well, to help us do our solution evaluation. Then when you have um, done our solution evaluation, select, we've selected up to three solutions. Out of the three solutions, we make one choice of a recommendation. But if the choice of our recommendation is not good for a good enough or our management decided not to choose, they will have to make at least three choice, three alternatives for them to fall back on if they are not choosing the if they are not choosing the, the, the first recommended solution. So and to do that we come up with our business case where we justify which solution we are going to uh, use for our project. So what is business case? Business case provide justification for undertaking a project, program, or portfolio. It evaluates benefit, cost, risk, and alternative options and provide a rationale for the preferred solution. So that is gotten um, a business case. And to do that, first we do the, the, the executive summary. If we're writing our business case, first thing we do is executive summary of the business case. We'll de describe a high level, um, we describe at high level the problem, synopsis, analysis, and explanation of the recommended solutions. So that's how we write our, our, our executive summary, because it's good to capture everything within the executive summary, because the, the, the management might not really have time to go through a detailed business case. They might not have time to go through all the pages of the business case. So the business case must have a very good executive summary where you capture everything. Then the next is a problem statement. Here you clearly and concisely describe the problem and the opportunities. Then you do the analysis. Here, during the analysis, here you analyze the, the current, where they, that's where you are going to do the documentation. All the documentation you have been doing, um, requirement um, in the, um, the current process, the, the gap analysis, and the future process, you capture all of them within this analysis stage. All the process mapping, you need to bring them here. The diagram, you must, all the diagrams must come here under the analysis. Then here is the solution options. All the solution options, all the analysis you made through the GAT, uh, um, Gartner reports, this is where you're going to bring all the solution options here. If it's, um, you are recommending for four solution, you bring the four solutions here and analyze the first solution using the cost 
and benefit analysis. That's what we are going to use to evaluate the cost and the benefit, benefit of each solution. And at the bottom or the last section of your business case, you make recommendation. Although you have four solutions for the uh, management to choose one, but here you are recommending they choose one of them. But if they don't want to choose one of them, then they should can choose one from the list of all the faults which you prioritize for them to choose. And that's how you write your business case. And this will bring you to the end of the initiate, initiate stage of a project within a project life cycle. This is another diagram for to help you understand business case. We start from here, overseeing body, project, assurance, activity, governance, desired future state, linked to strategic priority, that is the strategic need and vision, the benefit that the initiative will deliver, potential options for achieving the vision and desired benefit. That's benefits here and options. Then budget is the funding plan. What is the potential cost? That's budget. Project plan, how it will be delivered. The delivery plan. Expected time scale or critical deadline. That's timeline. Consider risk. Consider risk to the initiative and any mitigation. With this, we do a risk analysis. What we'll be using um, um, if you, so I have some if captured within the red log. You have this way we bring them in. Any known issue that might impact the initiative. Any issue you have, you have captured within the read log, you bring them here. Dependencies, that is any other activity that this initiative might be dependent on. This is where you bring in the dependencies. On that read log, you must have captured dependencies as well, because read is a risk. Um, Uh, you must have uh, captured them um, in under this particular here. The dependence is part of the read. You should be captured. So that is um, the business case. And that is um, what to have for business case. And I'm afraid we need to stop here because of time, because the is really taking time, so which I don't want to exceed three hours for this particular um, lectures. It's too much, and I don't like a too long a lecture because find out that a lot of people are already not flowing anymore. So we'll continue with. Um, user story next tomorrow. And I believe by next tomorrow we can finish the rest. So we'll still have time. So this is a two weeks, we have two weeks timeline. Uh, so we'll still have time. i will just hurrying up to see if we can join up the class I've been delaying to merge with you guys. 
but I can say that it's not working. So let's follow our timeline. So we are stopping here in a um, business case. Yeah, the only thing is that we've recorded this class and uh, we we explained it uh, very well. So, any question at this point? For those that are here are not yet sleeping, I can see Fola Shade is still here and uh, Lovett is here and Donald is here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's not an easy journey, but I assure you it's going to be very beneficial. Yes. Like my class, my previous class, the class before you people, now they are they are smashing job jobs anyhow now. So within within our our meeting over the weekend I had with them, I've got six people that uh, got job already. They're giving their mm. testimonies. Mm. So, so that is it. So you can see it's uh, very very beneficial, and more people are telling me that. They are having um, interviews here and there, both in Nigeria, both in Upwork, both international job. Some people that have, some of one of my students said they've got a job from one of the American companies. They'll be work after one week. They actually say that um, they wanted, if possible, for 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 her to come to America. But they wow. really wanted her a local. That's and, a nice one. Uh, yeah, and another one starting a, started a business analysis job today. And so many project managers have gotten a jobs, gotten jobs already. So is um is rewarding. So when I see this uh, uh, this their uh, testimonies. It motivates me to to fire up and motivate my students that it can be uh, a bit tough, like coming coming back from work and jumping into a three hours training. It's not easy. I know that. Yeah. Well, we are going to stop here tonight and I'm going to give you guys a break tomorrow. Next, tomorrow we finish it up and then we'll start our, our work placement. And then by tomorrow, I'll use tomorrow to document the next assignment for you guys. Yeah. Okay. Any question? All right. Sir. Oh. Well, I wish you guys good night rest because I know you guys, Thank you, sir. You guys are tired. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Good night. Good night.